So thank you for introduction and everyone for coming back after a week of delay. Today I'm talking about monochromated stem eels with a very specific focus on the wean filter of the Titan microscopes. I'm going to assume that as an audience member, you have at least a little bit of familiarity with eels in a transmission electron microscope, and ideally also with some of the aberrations that can be found in electron microscope. If you're not so familiar with this topic, I would recommend afterwards also checking out some of the other CCM webinars. I also assume that because you're here today, you're interested in understanding the Wien filter monochromator, which is the model installed in Thermo Fisher microscopes. So at the CCM, we have a low base Titan and a high base Titan, both of which are equipped with a Wien filter monochromator. I'm going to cover today a brief introduction to monochromated eels in the Wien filter and what it is some of the principles of operation, the parameters of interest that a user might think about when they're setting up their experiment. And finally, some of the factors that affect the resolution of the Wien filter. To get started, I'm gonna go with a very basic, somewhat basic introduction to monochromated eels in the Wien filter. Now monochromation is very interesting for eels because using a monochromator, you're able to improve the energy resolution of your spectrum. If I take an eel spectrum and I look at the zero loss peak, these are electrons which have not lost any significant amount of energy to the sample. I look at the zero loss peak and I look at the full width at half maximum and I use this as a measure of the energy resolution of my spectrum. The unmonochromated zero loss peak can have an energy resolution on the order of a few hundred milliEV to an EV. This is dominated by the energy of spread of electrons as emitted from the FEG itself and can be made worse by instabilities in the high tension, instabilities and aberrations in the spectrometer, the point spread function of the camera used on the spectrometer, or electric, electromagnetic or mechanical noise from the environment that the microscope is placed in. Using a monochromator can help us to reduce at least the energy spread from the FEG in order to resolve finer features in our spectrum. If you think about the zero loss peak, you consider this zero loss peak is impacting our sample. It's convolved with the true spectrum from the sample and can result in blurring spectral features together. So in the low loss regime, the tails of the zero loss peak can also hide low energy signals, making them difficult or impossible to identify. Use of a monochromator helps us to um, reveal, for example, in the core loss, reveal the near edge structure allowing us to identify oxidation or bonding states in different elements. In the low loss spectrum, the monochromator has a huge advantage because we're now able to study excitations down to the infrared, visible, and UV region of the spectrum, which can include excitations in the valence electron structure or atomic vibrational modes, really revealing a whole new world of excitations to study. This, the monochromator helps us to study this region both by improving the energy resolution and by reducing the tails of the zero loss peak so that we're able to distinguish some of these lower peaks, lower energy peaks. Another use of the monochromator is as a chromatic aberration corrector. If you reduce the energy spread of your beam, you're reducing chromatic aberration and can improve the spatial resolution of a high resolution image. Today, I'm gonna to focus on one particular monochromator, the Wien filter that the Titan microscopes are equipped with. Now the Wien filter is quite a short monochromator and requires no bending of the electron beam. It travels in a straight path. This was designed to reduce the aberrations that having a monochromator can introduce. This filter provides a lot of flexibility in choosing the balance between current and energy resolution, depending on the needs of the user. However, this flexibility comes with the cost that it can be quite difficult to align and the user needs to know what they're doing in order to have get what they want out of the monochromator. This monochromator is also held at high tension and it can be very sensitive to any instabilities there may be in the high tension supply. What this means, practically speaking, for the user is that they may observe the mono drifting a lot and have to keep correcting for that drift. So if I look in a microscope, where actually is the Wien filter? If we take the, tight, the low base Titan, for example, at the CCM, the Wien filter is right up at the top of the column here. It is placed immediately after the filament and a gun lens, we have the monochromator, and right before the accelerator. So the electrons are traveling through the monochromator at low energy. 
Following the accelerator is the C1 aperture plane, which can hold an energy selecting slit, important for monochromated work. After which the beam enters the condenser system and you can do your standard TM or STEM imaging alignments. So that was a very quick intro to what, what it is and where it is in the column. Now we'll take a look at the basic principles of how it works. If I take electrons from the filament, these electrons enter the monochromator. There are a pair of orthogonal electric and magnetic fields which disperse the beam according to energy. These fields effectively form a rainbow at the exit plane of the filter where the user will then insert a slit aperture in order to select a small range of these energies and reduce the energy spread of their beam. Because the Wien filter is before the accelerator, the whole dispersed line will be accelerated before energy selection and the energy resolution is dependent on the accelerating voltage. So for example, on the CCM's Titans, we're gonna obtain the best energy resolution at a low accelerating voltage, 80, ki 80 kilovolts on the microscopes we have here. So we'll take a closer look at how the electric and magnetic fields of the Wien filter disperse the beam. If we send in an electron of the desired energy, the electric and magnetic fields very precisely balanced to keep that electron on a straight trajectory through the monochromator. If we instead send in an electron of lower energy, this electron is traveling at a lower speed and the magnetic force, which is proportional to the velocity, is weaker. The electric force dominates and the slower electron is deviated towards one electrode. If we then send in a higher energy electron, this one has a higher velocity, the magnetic force is increased and now dominates over the electric force. This electron is deviated towards the opposite electrostatic electrode. Now we expand this logic to the spectrum of electrons that we get from the tip. This produces a dispersed rainbow at the exit plane of the mono, where now the energy of an electron has been translated into a spatial location, which allows us to filter based on spatial location with our aperture. What we end up with at the exit is effectively a series of images of the source dispersed in a line according to their energy. So if you imagine here that each of these circles represents an image of the electron source at a different energy, these are now dispersed in space. So this is essentially the basic principle of how the Wien filter operates. Next, you might be wondering what parameters you need to consider when you're setting up for an experiment. The parameters to set up include the excitation, which represents the strength of the Wien filter's fields, and the potential of the monochromator, which determines the energy at which electrons travel through the filter. Other important parameters include the choice of gun lens setting and the selection of condenser apertures. I'm gonna start with the excitation. So at zero excitation, the beam is not dispersed according to energy. The exit plane of the monochromator holds simply an image of the source. At low excitation, the fields are relatively weak and there is only a little dispersion at the exit plane. As the excitation is increased, the beam is dispersed more strongly according to energy and the energy selecting slit, which is a fixed size, can select a smaller range of energies. So you have from a higher dispersion, typically you would have a higher energy resolution, but also less current because you're cutting out all of the electrons that are not the right energy. Now the operation of the monochromator relies on having a chromatic line focus, that is a focused rainbow of electrons at the exit plane of the mono. The excitation plays a very important role in determining where this chromatic line focus is. If you consider for a moment an electron entering the mono away from the optical axis, so one of these electrons off to the side here, the electron is deflected by the electric and magnetic fields first towards the center, then onwards towards the opposite electrode, and then it comes back to the center and then back to its original axis. This forms a cycle and can be represented as an excitation of two pi. This hypothetical mono with an excitation of two pi forms an achromatic image of the entrance beam at the exit plane. What we want, however, is not an image of the entrance beam, but an image of the source dispersed according to energy or a chromatic line focus. This occurs at the point in the cycle where all the off-axis of electrons of the same energy 
converge on the optical axis. So this is the point at which we want to set up the exit plane of the mono. Now, in order to maintain a chromatic line focus at the exit, we use the gun lens to control the angle at which electrons enter the mono. At a low excitation, the gun lens needs to provide a strong focusing power to provide the entrance of the mono with a convergent beam. At an ex excitation of approximately pi over two or 1.6, we tune the gun lens so that the mono is provided with approximately parallel beam from the emission cone of the tip. While at a high excitation, the electrons traveling through the mono have a chance to complete, complete a larger portion of this uh, cycle that I described on the previous slide. And we need only a weak gun lens to provide a slightly divergent beam to the mono. Now, from the user's perspective, when the gun lens, which is listed as monofocus in the alignments, is set perfectly, the user should see a very sharp dispersed line as imaged on the left here. When the gun lens is away from the perfect strength, we no longer have a nice chromatic line focus, but instead the beam broadens in the non-dispersive direction and shrinks in the dispersive direction as we move towards having an achromatic image of the mono entrance aperture. So to sum up these couple of slides, the excitation of the monochromator plays a strong role in determining the dispersion you get at the exit plane. And it, the excitation works in concert with the gun lens in order to keep a chromatic line focus at the exit plane. The next parameter to set is the potential of the filter. This determines the voltage at which the filter is held relative to the filament, remembering that both of these components are held at high voltage relative to ground. When the mono is held at a low potential, such as 800 volts, electrons travel more slowly through the mono and so spend more time in the electric and magnetic dispersing fields. This means that for the same excitation, a filter at lower potential will have a higher dispersion. Now, the potential of the mono is an important thing to think about when considering the different settings of the gun lens. The gun lens is a three electrode electrostatic lens made up of the extraction anode, the gun lens anode, and the Wien filter itself. The extraction anode extracts electrons from the tip, then the gun lens channels them into the monochromator at the desired angle. On older microscopes, the user had a choice between accelerating or decelerating mode of the gun lens. Uh, the accelerating mode is only available on microscopes with SFEGs. And now the company is replacing most of these SFEGs with XFEGs, where only the decelerating mode is available. That said, accelerating mode still has some kind of interesting physics to think about as regards the behavior of the mono. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about that as well. In accelerating mode, again, only available if the machine is equipped with an, a shot key peg. The Wien filter is held at a lower potential than the gun lens anode. So the Wien filter potential is lower than the gun lens anode. And the gun lens anode is at a higher potential than the extraction anode. This means that electrons travel faster through the gun lens anode, and the lensing action of the gun lens takes place closer to the entrance of the monochromator. This means that the gun lens collects a smaller solid angle of the emission cone, resulting in reduced current and reduced contributions from high angle aberrations. Electrons travel through the mono at slower speeds and are thus more sensitive to high tension instabilities, making accelerating mode more difficult to use. However, as I discussed previously, at a lower potential, electrons travel more slowly and you get a high, much higher dispersion in the mono. So in this mode, you would tend to expect a higher energy resolution than in decelerating mode. In decelerating mode, this is the mode available on microscopes equipped, equipped with an XFEG, as both our Titans are now. The gun lens anode is held at a lower potential than the extraction anode and the monochromator is held at the highest potential. The lensing action of the gun lens is close to the gun lens anode, thus collecting a larger portion of the tip's emission. Because the effective lens is closer to the filament, we've changed the optics and decelerating mode results in a larger magnification of the source image at the exit plane of the mono. Although the aberration coefficients of the gun lens in this mode are lower, spherical and chromatic aberrations contribute 
from, from this lens contribute more strongly because of the higher acceptance angle from the tip. Another point to note is that although there are a couple of reasons why this mode might give you a lower energy resolution, you will have a much higher current and it is easier to operate. The next a new option that a user might have is to use the Ultimono mode, which has relatively recently been installed on the high base Titan here at the CCM. The Ultimono mode uses a lower beam current through the monochromator, reducing the blurring effects that a high beam current can cause. Filter is usually held at a low potential, resulting in a high dispersion at the exit plane and thereby a high energy resolution. On the microscope, a dispersed line from the Ultimono might look like this, with an excitation of 1.8 and a mean filter potential of 800 volts. When we insert our energy selecting slit, we are inserting a tiny aperture into the C1 plane and cutting out the majority of this dispersed line as visualized here, just to give you an idea of just how dispersed this is relative to a one micron hole in the C1 aperture plane. Now the C1 aperture plane is a conjugate plane to the exit plane of the monochromator. After exiting the mono, the electrons are accelerated to their full energy through the accelerator. The accelerator also acts as a weak lens to pass the exit plane of the filter onto the C1 aperture plane. The C1 aperture plane aperture strip contains a variety of small slit and hole apertures on the order of one or two microns across, which the user can select, select to cut the beam. Now a smaller aperture may give you a higher energy resolution, but it will also cut more of your beam current. So again, here's another parameter to find your balance between beam current and energy resolution. The next aperture down, the C2 aperture, is commonly used for setting up the imaging conditions. This is important for the dispersed beam, the C1 aperture, and the C2 aperture to be nicely centered on each other, as demonstrated in the bottom picture. The dispersed beam can be centered using the mono shift functions, which shifts it above the C1 aperture, while the centering of the apertures themselves, including the C1 aperture slit and the C2 aperture, this round hole, can be done using mechanical aperture drives. Interestingly, the C2 aperture can also be used to cut high angle aberrations of the beam, reducing the apparent width of the dispersed beam and providing some advantage to the energy resolution of the spectrum, as we see by comparing the tails of the blue spectrum with a smaller C2 aperture with the tails of the dashed pink spectrum with a larger C2 aperture. So the C2 aperture choice can be another thing to consider, although you may have to balance that with the requirements of your imaging conditions. <clears throat> Next step is to take a look at the different factors that can affect the energy resolution of this filter. These factors include the beam current passing through the, the filter, wherein a high beam current can cause, result in the Borsch effect or stochastic blurring. We, these also include aberrations in the gun lens and aberrations in the monochromator. Generally at lower excitations, the gun lens is more strongly excited and its aberrations have more effect on the beam. While at higher excitations, aberrations in the mono begin to limit the resolution. But first we'll start with the effects of beam current. So the Borsch effect is a result of Coulomb interactions between electrons in a beam with a high beam current. When the electrons are close enough together in the column, they repel each other via Coulomb forces. Statistically, the electrons will not be evenly spaced. They're not emitted at a precise timing from the tip. So statistically, some electrons will be closer to each other than other electrons, and there may be uneven forces happening vertically in the column. This results in some electrons losing speed and being retarded, and others gaining speed and being advanced. Overall, this broadens the energy spread of the beam and makes your energy resolution worse. This can be a problem, particularly in the low potential wean filter, where the electrons are traveling relatively slowly, if you have a high current, they spend a lot of time in proximity to each other. It could also be a problem more in decelerating mode where you have a very high beam current. There are just more electrons traveling through the space at a very similar time. So 
Stochastic blurring is a similar effect, but instead it affects the broadening of the source image when two electrons, this occurs when two electrons repel each other laterally in the column. So an image of the gun of the source may end up being a larger, more blurred image of the source. This causes an apparent increase in the source size, which in turn affects the energy resolution. Now, why does this affect the energy resolution? Because if we think about the exit plane of the mono, and we think about this rainbow that I drew as a series of images of the source dispersed according to energy, we now compare a nicely focused image of the source to a blurred image of the source. If stochastic blurring broadens your source size, there is now more overlap between neighboring energies and a resulting decrease in energy resolution when we project this onto the slit. So this, this plot considers the size of the electron beam as a function of distance from the tip, comparing two different mean filter potentials. At a low potential, the axial distance between electrons in the filter, that's this line here, is lower. So the Bush effect and stochastic blurring should be worse than in a filter at high potential. This is comparing two filters with the same beam current. The beam diameter at the end of the filter is higher when the potential of the filter is lower. That's this dashed line. So the beam diameter is higher. So for the same current, the low potential filter, because of this effect, should have a worse energy resolution. However, in the low potential filter, the effects of this broadening are counterbalanced by having a higher dispersion available, which in the end can result in a higher energy resolution despite the additional blurring. So we kind of have two competing factors here. But overall, to sum up, the Coulomb interactions inside the filter have a worse effect when the, either the beam current is high or the filter potential is low. Apart from Coulomb interactions, the next set of aberrations are the gun lens aberrations. There, these gun lens aberrations can also broaden the apparent source size at the exit plane of the mono. One of the main ones that the user might see is coma resulting from mechanical misalignment between the tip and the mono entrance aperture. If the tip is perfectly centered, the aperture accepts a nice symmetrical range of angles. Whereas if the tip is off center, one side of the aperture is selecting electrons traveling at a higher angle than electrons at the other side of the aperture, resulting in uneven intensity of the beam and this sort of comet-shaped tail as visualized on the right side here. The effect of coma is worse in decelerating mode because the lensing action of decelerating mode is closer to the filament and it has a much higher acceptance angle. So we're going to see a lot more of these high angle electrons coming in. As visualized in the dispersed line, coma from tip alignment is visible in the low excitation lines of the decelerating gun lens. So here we have a series of images of the chromatic line focus or the rainbow of electrons as a function of excitation for the accelerating and decelerating gun lens. So here we see coma in this sort of comet shaped tail on the decelerating gun lens. Whereas at the same excitation in the accelerating gun lens, we have a lower acceptance angle and the effect of coma is much less. As we increase the excitation, we reduce the strength of the gun lens and the contribution of gun lens aberrations such as coma is reduced. And we can see this in the reduction in the size of this line in the non-dispersive direction. Other aberrations in the gun lens, specifically spherical and chromatic aberrations, have higher coefficients in the accelerating gun lens, but a higher contribution in the decelerating gun lens, again, because the decelerating gun lens has a high acceptance angle from the tip. In general, though, as we increase the excitation, the effect of aberrations from the gun lens will be reduced. So you might accept, expect higher energy resolution from increased excitation. Now the chromatic aberration from the gun lens is kind of interesting because the mono spreads the beam according to energy. So the chromatic aberration is now directly visible at different locations in the beam. So if we have a nicely focused beam, we 
you may notice the edges of the beam are more blurred because of the chromatic aberration of this focus. If we tweak the focus by a small amount, the region of good focus moves and one end or the other end of the beam become more blurred because of the chromatic aberration. So as we change the focus, we can see the blurring move across the dispersed line. On the screen, this results in kind of images a little bit like this when you're just very slightly over or under focus. The gun lens can only focus a very small range of energies well, and so the ends of our um, dispersed line are going to be slightly out of focus. So this plot allows us to examine the contributions of each of the factors mentioned above to the source size at the exit plane of the Wien filter. Now the decelerating gun lens, because the lens is closer to the filament, it again has a larger magnification of the source at the filter exit. So just the bare decelerating gun lens with no aberrations accounted for produces a larger spot size at the filter exit than the accelerating gun lens does. Now, because the decelerating gun lens has a higher acceptance angle, when we include aberrations, these dashed lines, the effects of the aberrations are going to have a worse effect on the decelerating gun lens because of this higher acceptance angle. Although the accelerating gun lens has a lower filter potential and the and so may experience more Coulomb broadening, the decelerating gun lens has a much higher current, which actually means that Coulomb broadening on the solid line actually has a much worse effect on the decelerating gun lens than it does on the accelerating gun lens. So overall, the accelerating gun lens is able to provide a smaller image of the source at the exit plane of the filter, even accounting for gun lens aberrations and Coulomb interactions in the filter. And so the accelerating gun lens will have a higher energy resolution than the decelerating gun lens can provide. That said, again, accelerating mode is also less stable, has a lower current, and is more difficult to operate. Next, we'll move on to the aberrations of the monochromator itself. The low order aberrations, namely focus and stigmation, are the ones that the user has control of, control of using the focus and stigmator knobs in the mono panel. The monofocus knob controls the gun lens. The monofocus shift is used to move the beam above the C1 aperture and center it. And the stigmators control electrostatic, electrostatic multipoles inside the filter. The most basic one is the focus. The monofocus controls the strength of the gun lens to change the angle of the incoming electrons, as we discussed before, in order to help us achieve a chromatic line focus at the mono exit plane. So in focus, we have a thin dispersed line over and under focused. These lines should expand. The image of the source gets larger. When the beam is properly focused, the user should see on the screen a thin line, the highest possible zero loss peak on the spectrum and the best mono resolution achievable for these settings. When the stigmators are properly set, the shape of the beam should be somewhat symmetrical when wobbling over and under focus. They're not perfectly set here, but they're fairly close. And you see the shape over and under focus are somewhat symmetrical. However, um, in order to make this shape symmetrical, the user will also need to take care of the stigmation of the beam before they can achieve the best resolution. In order to do this, the user needs to be able to visualize the chromatic line focus in focus on the screen at the bottom of the microscope. To do this, we have to make sure that the condenser system is focused on the exit plane of the monochromator as represented by the conjug conjugate plane <coughs> of the C1 aperture. To make sure that the condenser system through the C2 lens is focused on the C1 aperture plane, the user needs to insert a slit into the C1 aperture. They should spread the mono and we wobble the gun shift by activating the slit wobbler button. They will then change the C2 lens in order to minimize the slit movement. 
you see it wobbling here, before removing the slit and proceeding with their stigmator alignments. Now there are stigmators in both X and Y. So first we'll talk about the Y stigmator. If you have a very poor Y stigmation, as you wobble the gun lens through focus and back, you will observe, you may observe a shape like this, where the beam is extremely stretched in two different directions over and under focus. A quick visualization of the effective source image shows us that we have a large blurred source when we're in focus. And as we go over and under focus, this direction of stigmation stretches the beam out in a 45 degree angle. Taking some snapshots out of the previous video shows, it at, shows us that at focus, we do indeed have a fat line, a very fat line in the non-dispersive direction, whereas we'd like to have a very skinny line in this direction. And comparing over and under focus states, we notice that these are at a sharp angle to the dispersive direction and to each other, indicating to us that the Y stigmation is poor. And to tune the Y stigmation, you would tend to want to be in focus and minimize the width of this line in the non-dispersive direction. Now the X stigmation can also be visualized by wobbling the gun lens through focus. It can be seen when the shapes on either side of the thinnest line are not symmetrical with each other, but appear to stretch out in opposite directions, horizontal and vertical. For example, we have horizontal stretching and more vertical stretching in this video. The X stigmation can be very tricky to align because even with a poor stigmation, the image of the beam can display a very thin line. However, the energy resolution of this line will be very poor. And the optimal resolution will be found when we're in a different case and the, in the overfocus condition where we'll have a lot fewer counts, but the stigmation is stretched in the opposite direction. So we may see a better, uh, a good energy resolution. But your counts will be very poor and visually on the screen, your beam will be very stretched. A rough alignment of the stigmation can be done based on the symmetry of the over and under focused shapes. So if we take here the thinnest line, which may not be the correct focus value, we go uh, at under and over this line, we see the symmetry of this shape is dominantly horizontally stretched. The symmetry of this shape is more vertically stretched. This tells me my X stigmation is bad. And you can do a rough, alignment of the X stigmators by wobbling through this thin line and trying to make these shapes more symmetrical. Typically, however, your fine tuning of the X stigmators will be done on the spectrum while you're looking at the energy resolution compared to the current. Higher order aberrations from the mono are mostly dominated by coma and threefold stigmation. These aberrations contribute more strongly when the excitation is high and begin to affect the resolution when the excitation is above about 1.8, as we can see by looking at the line width in the non-dispersive direction. This is a comparison of the effective source size, a representation of the effective source size, this width. So the goal for the user seeking the best energy resolution must be then to choose an excitation where the contributions from both the gun lens and the mono are minimized together. If you remember the gun lens have high aberrations at low excitations, the monochromator has high aberrations at high excitations, we need to find a point somewhere in the middle. So to try to sum up the useful points for a future user, the excitation must be chosen to give the desired energy resolution without cutting too much beam current, keeping in mind the relative contributions of the gun lens and the monochromator aberrations. The potential of the filter also affects the resolution, both through the prospect of Coulomb interactions in the filter and through the spatial length of the chromatic line focus, which the aperture can select. The gun lens settings must be chosen in order, again, to balance the need for current with the need for high resolution. 
a general user might choose to go with the lowest resolution they can get away with in order to study their sample in order to have a higher current and a better signal to noise ratio. Whereas a user wanting the highest resolution possible will end up finding ways to work around having a low current. So a quick example of what I've been able to see here at the CCM using the two wean filters on the low base and high base Titans. On the low base Titan, we used to have a, an SFEG installed and we were able to achieve a zero loss peak of around 40 milli electron volts at full width half max. After the SFEG was exchanged for an XFEG, we were able to achieve a resolution of about 60 milli EV because of several of the factors I've already discussed earlier. Adding the ulti mono onto the Titan high base pushes the resolution of the high base Titan down to around 30 milli EV. And of course, there is always room to improve. With that, here is some of the papers relating to the Wien filter. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them as best as I can. Thank you. Great, thanks, Isabel. Um, apparently my video refuses to start, so I'm just gonna be my little science block. <laughs> so if anyone yeah. has any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat and Q&A. Um, I guess just to get us started, could you comment a little on if you're going for absolute best resolution, how you would fight to get current? I'm assuming that also depends on how stable the the mono is um, allowing you to maybe acquire for longer. It does. I've found doing things like relying on the C2 aperture to help you cut the higher order aberrations can help. You can afford to have a, a larger aperture in C1. If you use C2 to help cut, it, it still helps to cut the beam current, um, but it does help with the resolution. Whereas having a very small aperture in C1 will cut a lot of beam current. If you make that a little larger and use a smaller C2, you cut less beam current, but it can also get a good resolution. Um, you also need to then start thinking about the integration time of your spectrometer, how many, if you can acquire a single spectrum and acquire 100 identical spectra, then sum them together. Um, tactics like that on the acquisition techniques in terms of acquiring a lot of spectra and then aligning them and summing them together to achieve a better signal to noise ratio. Great, um, there's a question in the chat. Uh, can you elaborate more about the ulti mono function? Are all the FEI Titan TEMs equipped with this function? So the, the ulti mono is a relatively new function that the Thermo Fisher is offering. Uh, not all of the Titans are equipped with this. I think it's something that the microscope owner asks FEI to install when, I mean, in, in our case, we had an upgrade to our Titan to add the ulti mono function. Um, I don't think it's there by default. I think if the owner of the microscope has requested it, then it can be installed on a monochromated Titan. Do you know um, anything about the difference between how the ulti mono functions um, compared to the, I guess, the other monochromators? Um, or is that sort of information FEI keeps to themselves? I mean, relative to other companies or within the Wien filter? Within the Wien filter. Um, so it does have, you, you notice when you turn on ulti mono, the beam current drops by a lot. So the, there's a factor of 10 less beam current in there, which reduces a lot all of the Coulomb interactions in the mono and helps a lot with your, um, the reducing the energy broadening of your slit. Because the, the XFEG is a very bright gun. It emits a lot of electrons. So you actually have quite a significant current traveling through your mono. Now with the ulti mono, the first thing it does is cut that beam current by a factor of, let, I don't, let's say 10 or so. So you're reducing those Coulomb interactions, you're reducing the source size at the exit. 
by quite a lot and you'll get a much thinner dispersed line. Um, apart from that, I don't know what the differences are. That would be a, a question for Thermo Fisher. Great, uh, thanks Isabel. I think that's all our questions.